Welcome all aspiring astronomers and curious minds to another episode of Discovering the Maverick Factor. I'm your host today. I'm McKenna Dowd. I'm the program coordinator for the UTA Planetarium. And with me today is special guest Levent Gerdemir, uh, the planetarium's director. And we're here to talk about um, a pretty historic celestial event that is uh, upcoming here on Monday, April 8th, 2024. So let's first talk about uh an eclipse. What is the total solar eclipse for those who may not know? Sure. Let's start with what is solar eclipse, which uh, is uh, the block of sunlight by the moon. So, uh, and if the, the, the light is partially blocked, uh, we call it partial eclipse. And if the light is totally blocked, the sunlight is totally blocked, then we call it total solar eclipse. Uh, the difference of the, the total solar eclipse, which makes it magnificent, is uh, the no sunlight means actually the daylight is turning into nighttime uh, for some time period during total solar eclipses, which is a phenomenal experience. Yeah, absolutely. I am. I'm really looking forward to it, and I know you are too. Um, so, why is this particular eclipse, um, this path of totality through the Metroplex, why is this so historic and monumental? Uh, absolutely. This uh, is very important eclipse because of the location. So uh, there is a misconception about uh, the total solar eclipses. A lot of uh, uh, people I heard from is uh, they say, oh, it's a rare event, right? So um, uh, not really, actually. If we look in general, total solar eclipses are happening actually pretty frequently, uh, approximately once in 18 months. Uh, but the thing is, the, it's a very local event, uh, and where happening is a very random. Uh, and if you think about 75% uh, of our planet is actually covered by water. So there is 75% of chance that a uh, solar eclipse would be all, uh, happening on water. So uh, if not water, uh, the, the, the rest of the land uh, is randomly picked, and sometimes it is a remote part of uh, Antarctica. Uh, sometimes it is, for example, the, the, the next one, uh, next, next one is going to be happening mostly uh, in the Iceland, over Iceland and Greenland. Good luck traveling there. Uh, and, and so on. Uh, but it is rare and important when it happens on a, an area like Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, which has the, 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 the second busiest international airport in the world, uh, has a lot of uh, uh, things to offer, a uh, lot of touristic attractions, a lot of hotels to stay, a lot of great food to eat. Uh, and also there's a great university to visit, uh, University of Texas at Arlington, if you haven't heard. Uh, so that makes it very important uh, events for uh, us uh, people live in, around Metroplex. Oh, absolutely. And what a wonderful time for, um, yeah, to show off the university, our facilities, um, and everything the DFW area definitely, definitely has to offer. So I'm thinking back to the first time that I witnessed an eclipse. And, and honestly, I, I kind of feel like a fraud a little bit in my field because space is my thing. So I feel like I should have seen a total eclipse, right? I have never seen a total eclipse. Um, so I am excited to see this one in April, but I have seen a partial eclipse. Um, the first time I was able to truly experience it with the glasses and the, and, you know, watching it safely with the solar filter and just seeing, you know, that crescent shape of the moon cover the sun was last October. October 14th, a partial eclipse that we had. Um, and I remember thinking how cool it was that all these people just were gathering to share this, you know, experience together. And so many people are asking questions and, and everyone's just, you know, looking up to the sky. And it's just a really fun and cool shared experience. So I guess I want to ask you, so, so why do you think people are just so fascinated uh, by events like these? Well, certainly there are uh, people who are called uh, eclipse chasers, mm. and those people are traveling around the world uh, to catch an eclipse. And uh, there are people uh, who were successful to catch eclipses uh, four or five times uh, in their life. And, uh, and they are 
talking all about it, all about that experience. And also they said uh, that every experience uh, was unique mm -hmm. uh, because it is happening in different parts of the world. Uh, you know, the duration of, is different. The time of the day is different. Uh, and lots of conditions are different. So uh, the, the, this is, uh, even though I'm an astronomer and astrophysicist myself for a long time, I have not experienced a total solar eclipse. Uh, again, uh, they are happening uh, on average once in 18 months. How come? Uh, the traveling is uh, the, the biggest issue and timing is also uh, the important. And sometimes, you know, we don't get to travel uh, whenever we want. And sometimes we don't get to travel because it is too far or uh, in a remote lo location that uh, it is hard to access. Uh, but if it, if, but this time it's actually happening uh, around our time. So we are not, not going to miss this one for sure. That's in our own backyard. Uh, but I heard from a lot of people that uh, the, the experience is great because uh, uh, it, it's a different environment in the middle of the day, almost in the middle of the day. Uh, unexpectedly, uh, the daylight uh, is disappearing, vanishing. And then uh, the nighttime, even stars become visible if the weather is clear. The temperature is dropping down. Animals start acting like it is nighttime. So um, I'm, I'm so looking forward to that, to experience for myself. Absolutely. And something I'm really looking forward to as well, because I think that's something people often forget about. Not only can you, can you see the eclipse, but you can feel the eclipse and you can hear the eclipse. And I think that's pretty cool that it has all those different effects on the animals, on the temperature on the sky. And so there's just many ways to to experience this. So um, with with that being said, I know why I think it's important for everyone to take the time out of their day to uh, look up and experience uh, this event. Uh, but why do you think it's important for people to just kind of pause and and in their day to look at this this event and experience this? Well, it is a uh... For most people, once in a lifetime event, unless they are eclipse chasers, because uh, there is also another statistics uh, telling us that uh, the chance of happening, the eclipse happening in the same area uh, twice is uh, about once in 400 years. Of course, there are exceptions to that. But uh, for example, uh, next DFW eclipse is going to happen in the year of 2345. So it's going to be quite some time uh, it's going to be quite a while uh, to, 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 wait, to wait for, for the next one. Yeah. Uh, and, and why it is, uh, it, why it needs to be experienced. I think this is the, the, the if the, there is something, uh, something different happening in the nature. Um, it is always great thing to, to, to witness to that because again, it is probably not going to happen uh, for a long time in the same area. Uh, and and you know the the, the, the it, it is it is just a unique unique, unique feeling that uh, the nature is changing the the order changing the the routine Absolutely. of the nature itself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and and what a great time that we have the knowledge that we do these days versus um, you know kind of delving a little bit into the history of celestial events like these where um, it was such a dramatic experience, you know. But, oh. Sorry, it's, it's amazing that uh, we knew uh, this eclipse was coming for uh, decades ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about it. Uh, and it is amazing that we can precisely mm -hmm. calculate, uh, even give the time uh, to the seconds, mm -hmm. uh, to the second accuracy, uh, when and how long it is going to happen at what magnitude it is going to happen. It is really amazing science. Oh, absolutely. That is one of my favorite things about um, just astronomy, astrophysics, any sort of space science. It's it's fantastic that we can can calculate all of these really, like you said, to the minutes, to the seconds, to the, it's it's insane. I feel like there's never a boring day. Mm -hmm. I remember when I uh, first uh, became the director of uh, UT Planetarium, it was 2008, and there was a note uh, from the, the previous director uh, transferred to me and note said uh, I hope for clear skies in April 8, 2024. <laughs> do you still have the note? I, I do. I do. <laughs> That's awesome. And I, I know we are both really hoping uh, it's, it's clear skies. Um, which is a perfect segue into the next question I want to ask you because I know what we're planning uh, for April 8th but um, what do you think is the best way for um, anybody listening 
uh, the best way to view and experience this eclipse in, in the DFW area? Well, coming to our solar operation is one thing. Uh, because UT campus is a large campus, and uh, we will uh, we are planning on great events for people, and not only uh, viewing the, the the eclipse, but also there will be uh, concerts. Uh, there will be uh, great activities on campus, and also there will be people around uh, to answer questions. Uh, we will be making some announcements. Uh, and uh, prior to the eclipse, even uh, there will be some uh, uh, the public observation uh, viewing nights, for example, at UT Observatory. Uh, we can also enjoy at nighttime, of course, the planets um, uh, Friday and Saturday uh, before the eclipse day. Uh, there will be some concerts as well and uh, the, the tons of activities. And the, the best way is going to be, or the, the only tool you will need is actually, uh, they are sitting right here, and it, it, just an eclipse glass like this. Uh, those are glasses with special solar filters. So those solar filters are designed to block more than 99, even 99.9 uh, sunlight. So the sun is the, the, the brightest thing in the nature. Uh, we cannot just uh, overcome the, the, the sunlight's brightness with uh, any other like light source. Uh, so uh, that intensity uh, is, uh, you know, our eyes, for eyes, it is very difficult to um, the, the compensate the, the intensity, even though uh, our eyes have, you know, lit mechanism and iris mechanism, which can limit the amount of light coming in, still sunlight is too bright. So those uh, glasses are designed to block that light to the safe level so we can observe the viewing. Of course, uh, the glasses will be needed uh, before and after the, the totality parts. The totality part I'm talking about, the, 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 the totality is when the no sunlight exists. So you can see, you can find a lot of uh, eclipse pictures, uh, eclipse pictures on the media uh, showing the, the sun's disk, uh, but it's uh, uh, just a, the, the black disk with uh, white ring around it. So this is uh, how the totality is going to look like. During that time, of course, you will not be able to see anything with the, the eclipse glasses. You will take them off, enjoy the eclipse. But as soon as the sunlight starts recovering, as soon as you start seeing the, the orange or yellow ball, um, uh, then you need to put back the, the glasses. Definitely don't want to risk any eye damage because our eyes don't have any nerves, right? So you can't feel the damage until it's potentially too late. So yeah, I want to make sure that take proper precautions and, and view um, the sun safely. Yeah. Uh, certainly the glasses are important to protect our eyes. Most of the damage is actually happening uh, when, the, uh, when the sunlight is recovering from the totality part. Mm -hmm. And the reason is if you just go outside right now and we can take a look at the sun, it is not going to hurt our eye for a short time period because nobody is going to be able to look at the sun for a long time. Because again, our eyes have you know, dimming and iris mechanism. And of course, you know, don't experiment that because every eye is different. Every, everybody's eye has different level of sensitivity and tolerance uh, for the sunlight. But on average, um, uh, the, the, the sun uh, is not going to cause damage in a short time. Uh, with that said, during the eclipse, there is something different, though. Uh, and that is uh, during the totality, because there is no sunlight, it is going to be pretty much like night. Mm -hmm. Our eyes will be wide open. Mm -hmm. All the iris and lids and everything. And this, when the sunlight starts recovering, mm -hmm. it will recover fast to the point that it can actually uh, damage eyes. So by the time eye makes the adjustments, damage can likely happen. Uh, that's why there are statistics uh, suggesting that the eye doctor visits increase after total solar eclipses. So it is very important to uh, have one of those. And as soon as uh, the totality ends or it is near to the end, just put glasses back and be safe. That is, yes, very good to know. Very good to know for sure. Something to keep in mind. Now, I do want to kind of talk about, um, as you kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, during totality of a total solar eclipse, 
when the moon completely blocks the sunlight. Um, this is a great time to look at the sun's outer atmosphere that we're not, we don't normally see. Uh, so I hear that the sun is at the peak this year of its 11-year cycle, so it's at maximum solar energy. So do you think this will be a fantastic time for um, science to just observe and take data on the sun during this eclipse? It must be important, and that's why uh, a lot of astronomers from International Astronomical Union is going to be coming to UTA uh, campus, and they are bringing their instruments as well to take scientific data during the, the, the solar eclipse. So, um, uh, as you mentioned, yeah, there is a, a very interesting uh, gassy layer around the sun. Surprisingly, it is called corona, but has nothing to do with the, the coronavirus disease. So this corona layer is responsible for, uh, because it is, uh, the, the, the temperatures are actually extreme in the corona layer. Uh, imagine uh, on the surface of the sun, uh, the temperatures are nearly 6,000 degrees. So when we go farther from the sun, we should expect temperatures to drop even further, but this is not happening in the, the corona gas layer. The temperatures are actually skyrocketing to a few million degrees in that part. So that triggers a lot of uh, plasma, mm -hmm. and these plasma streams are coming uh, all around the solar system. Uh, and uh, and because this uh, plasma is uh, electrically charged, those are electrically charged particles, mm -hmm. they are being trapped by, and fortunately they are being trapped by the magnetic field of Earth. Mm -hmm. So uh, be uh, the, the, the trapped particles uh, moves along the magnetic fields of Earth, and we, we know that the Earth's magnetic fields are terminating at the north and south poles. Mm -hmm. When these particles interact with our uh, the, the oxygen in the atmosphere, they glow, yeah. and uh, this glow is called northern and southern lights, and popularly known as northern lights. So uh, one of the reasons people travel to these northern countries and uh, latitudes to experience those. Uh, so th this is a great phenomenon. It's all originating from the corona layer. There is also another uh, uh, important uh, phenomena uh, re uh, the originating from corona layer, and those are coronal mass ejections, CMEs. And those are at bigger scale, literally uh, fireballs uh, released by the surface of the sun and shoots in one direction in the solar system. So uh, those can be really harmful for us and our planet. Uh, in the small scale, they can damage the communication satellites, mm -hmm. even the communication systems down Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was uh, very interesting that uh, a few months ago, I received a call from our police department. Uh, uh, they asked if there is any solar activity going on, if I know. Uh, because they heard from different agencies that there were reports about lost communication systems intermittently. Uh, so and I checked with uh, the, our space physicists in the physics department, and they confirmed that there was indeed a solar activity on that part. So what's happening out there can really affect our life and the things working over here. Uh, so um, for that reason, it is important to study what's going on up there. And the solar eclipses are giving us great opportunity, even though there are satellites uh, observing the sun constantly and uh, giving us a scientific data. Mm -hmm. But uh, during a solar eclipse, there is actually a great uh, picture uh, uh, from uh, Dr. Deng of physics that uh, she showed at one of the, the presentation um, uh, over here, that it's a split image, the right side is showing uh, uh, the image of a solar eclipse taking the image of the sun or corona layer taken during a solar eclipse, mm -hmm. total solar eclipse, and the left side is showing the same image uh, taken by satellites. Mm -hmm. uh, the ground-based image was so detailed uh, and so in high resolution that it is not only impressive to look, but also uh, carries important scientific data. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. No, thank you. Yeah, this is all incredible things to look forward to for this eclipse, whether it be for the um, experience of it all or even just the science behind it. Um, but I do want to transition because uh, 
I am really proud of our facility at the planetarium, and I know you are too. So I don't know, for those of uh, you who don't know, UTA is home to one of the largest planetariums in North Texas. We have it right here on campus. We have a state-of-the-art facility. And I know of how hard we work and our mission uh, here at the planetarium. But do you want to talk a little bit um, about that, event, about our, our uh, facility? Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, as you noted, uh, one of the largest planetarium facility in the, the state of Texas. Uh, we're really proud of it. We have uh, 150 very comfortable uh, seats uh, located on their 60 feet planetarium projection screen, which is dome shape. Uh, and uh, we have projection system in great resolution and detail. We can project pretty much uh, uh, anything in the universe in high detail uh, with scientific accuracy as well. So in this planetarium, we do uh, great programs like uh, K-12 field, field trips, public shows, astronomy classes, uh, plus uh, children's birthday parties, engagements, proposals, uh, and so on. Uh, this is a really great facility uh, in the place uh, in, in, the, in, in North Texas. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think um, it really sets us apart from, from other uh, maybe similar facilities or other places that we can um, use. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Especially with like a music under stars and new yes. wellness program, yes. uh, meditation under stars. Yes, I was going to bring up how um, just the collaboration we've been able to do across campus between working with uh, the counseling and psychological services to do mindful moments under the dome, free to all faculty, student and staff, uh, we've been hosting a concert series. We bring live local artists in um, where you literally listen to gorgeous music under the stars. Um, we have a lot of a lot of cool events. We're doing a lot more movie nights uh, in, in the dome, which um, is how can you beat that, right? In a surround sound. It's like a movie theater. I like to I like to call us a movie theater, but not really because we're way cooler than an average movie theater since, you know, the whole ceiling is your movie theater screen. So. Um, it's pretty, pretty special. I don't know. Now that we have Digistar 7, uh, which is the most top-notch planetarium software we can have, it's, it's fantastic in there for sure. Absolutely. I mean, looking at Mars, I feel like I'm really yeah. orbiting Mars uh, in a spacecraft. And yeah, no, and absolutely. And that has been one of my favorite parts of, of hosting field trips to the local, uh, what, what is it now? We see upwards of over... 30,000 K through 12 students throughout the DFW area who come visit our facility. And I like to call each and every one of them astronauts who come in our dome because we truly do. We explore uh, space and we can go, we can go to Mars. We can land on Mars. We can fly outside of the Milky Way. And it's incredible seeing all these students come in and leave with more questions uh, than they first initially had. And they're just so fascinated and curious about uh, space. You know, and it's something that I think is a very fun and uh, unique shared experience that these students can have in, in our space. Isn't that amazing when they are coming out of the door, uh, they have all expressions yes. of yes. how much they love this experience. Oh, wow. They are saying that was the best field trip ever. <laughs> I heard things like this was the best day ever, best presentation or best time ever. My gosh, they have so much fun. I mean, we of course we end with the roller coaster ride on another planet. So how can you beat that as well? But between visiting space, taking rocket ship rides, quite literally, because how often can you say that, right? You can do that right here uh, in our facility, and it's just oh, absolutely, absolutely. I I have students who will you know raise their hand, ask questions. They'll be like, you know, they'll tell me everything they know about black holes, and they're in second grade. Like, the, and it's fantastic what these kids want to learn, what they already know, and how curious they are. Um, and I know that's something we really strive for and really, really um, are proud of at the planetarium. And also live nature of the presentation. Yes. So uh, the black hole is most of the time is not actually in the queue. Uh, so somebody brought, brings up, uh, a student says, I really would like to see a black hole. And uh, the presenter says, uh, do you really... Are you sure you want to see a black hole? Oh, yes, I'm sure I would like to see a black hole. Then uh, the, the the presenter is kind of uh, preparing the system to go to a black hole. So in a 
imaginary spaceship, we fly to a black hole and we end up diving and getting lost in a black hole, right? The only difference is we promise them to bring them back. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Because in reality, uh, anything goes inside of a black hole, there is no chance of return. Mm -hmm. uh, so we explain that. But then uh, we return our planetarium back into Arlington, Texas. Yeah. Absolutely. The universe is truly the limit in the dome. I mean, there's no place we really can't go explore, look at, view. Uh, and it's incredible. I, I know there's been students who've tried to, to um, trip me up in a sense of like, oh, can we visit this very specific uh, icy planet like out in the Kuiper Belt? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely, not a problem. And you just type it in. We'll fly a rocket ship there and uh, we can see whatever these students can imagine. Just absolutely fantastic. And all presented based on uh, scientific available yes. data. And nothing is like artists' conception. Yes. Yep. Everything is, is true to the science, the distances, their their appearance, all of that. Available map. Yep. Years, uh, they ask in the planetarium uh, why Pluto was so fuzzy while other planets have great details. And uh, we said because that was the only available uh, data about how Pl Pluto looked by that time. But later, uh, better observations, better telescopes, especially a New Horizon mission, uh, there was a detailed map of Pluto, uh, and later we started be we, we were able to show up uh, show uh, a great image of Pluto. So, what do you hope visitors take away from their experience when they they enter our planetarium? I hope they. Uh, First, answer some of the scientific questions they may have to begin with. Uh, second, uh, impress with the um, greatness of the universe, mm -hmm. uh, inspired by uh, the space and space sciences about what we do, what astrophysicists do, what space physicists do, what even physicists do uh, uh, about, you know, the space uh, and uh I'm hoping that our presentations will encourage people uh, look at the sky and wonder about the things going above us. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Out of, out of all the things I'm curious to know personally, um, since I've been here almost two years now as the program coordinator for the um, planetarium, I've been having personally a lot of fun planning some cool stuff for our dome. But I want to hear what is what is... Uh, your favorite thing that uh, we have ever done in the Dome so far, or maybe something that's upcoming as well? Well, every thing actually is my favorite thing to do in the planetarium because that's why we we, we do it. And uh, and I like experimenting uh, new uh, programs. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, like, for example, Mindful Moments was one of the things, Music Under Stars, Dinner Under Stars mm -hmm. is also another thing we forget to mention. Yeah, the couples can get, you know, dinner... Uh, in the planetarium, romantic thing. Yeah, three course meal with wine under the stars. Two people, just a little. I mean, even the roller coasters were uh, an experiment yeah. uh, at the planetarium because there was a lot of debate uh, within the even planetarium community, not only uh, among the the, the the scientists or planetariums. Uh, the debate was about uh, whether we should incorporate roller coasters uh, in the planetarium or not, are we just uh, degrading the value of uh, space and science teaching by uh, in in involving these roller coasters? But it turns out, actually, uh, it is uh, providing such a great uh, entertainment experience. Uh, I realize that the, the kids are uh, more motivated mm -hmm. to... Uh, get the, uh, or learn about the scientific content, uh, learn about the rest of the presentation mm -hmm. at the planetarium. Because they always talk about, you know, how cool the, the roller coaster ride was. But this is not the only thing they talk about. They also talk about how cool was the, the presentation, how cool was the Orion constellation, mm -hmm. how cool was uh, planet uh, and Jupiter as a planet, etc. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that this is just providing a great value. And these are all experiments. And uh, the, I think the experiment is my favorite thing to yeah. do in the dome. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a fantastic answer. 
because I, I agree. I, I mean, I think it's very fun to see what we can do in the dome and see see what the the limit, if there is one, of what we can do, whether, yeah, it be mindfulness or roller coasters or music. I mean, whatever. It's been absolutely fantastic. But even on the roller coaster part, too, there is science in those as well. Like one of my favorite roller coasters I love to play um, for students is one through the rings of Saturn. And it does a good job explaining that, you know, the rings of Saturn are not solid. They're made up of lots of little particles. That's why we're able to ride a roller coaster through them. And so even if, you know, a student didn't think of that when they first walked in, even though they had fun on the roller coaster, they think, oh, yeah, now they know a little bit more about Saturn's rings as well with that, the visual in it all. So Yeah, uh, that is correct. And even uh, one of the, uh, the the first ride from the pre- previous version of the, uh, the the roller coasters, one of the ride was actually a swing ride on Mercury. Mm. And one of our physics students wanted to calculate if the, uh, the oscillation period was right because there is moon gravity, mm-hmm. The uh, pendulum's gravity will not have no effect on this, but the, the, since the Mercury's gravity is known, uh, wanted to calculate if the, um, uh, the, the oscillation period was set right mm-hmm. on the Mercury. That is incredible. Did you ever find out? Were they, was it ever accurate? Uh, well, I'm asking the question when people come to the planetarium, yeah. if they're interested <laughs> in finding out uh, the, the oscillation period, whether it's not right or not. Gosh, that is, that is incredible. So I want to ask, out of all our shows that we have in our very large selection of, of shows, but we have shows that cover every topic imaginable uh, when it comes to space, uh, what is your favorite show that we have? I know what mine is. Those are all my favorites. <laughs> and, and, uh, well, I uh, pretty much handpicked over time yes. uh, all of them, uh, most of them. Uh, there was... The lo- there were for each show long time of evaluation, mm-hmm. uh, talking with other people uh, who uh, adopted the show about their experience, their viewers' experience, uh, and also traveling to other planetariums and seeing the shows in person, attending to those shows, and finding out what the, the what my reaction is, what other audience the reaction is. Uh, so I because I handpicked uh, most of the shows I. I'm not going to distinguish. Yeah, it's a very tough decision. Being, um, man, I don't know. I just I like how creative a lot of these shows get in how they explain things. Um, I do want to call out a show you recently picked called Beyond the Sun that talks about how we find exoplanets, and it's it's generated for a younger audience. We'll see elementary school age, but it's fantastic in the sense that it goes into some of the science and into some of the formulas without getting too crazy. So it's introducing these kids to um, how to be an exoplanet hunter. Uh, and it's just, it's so incredible how we're able to explain some of these tough topics um, to all different ages and all different um, grade levels. Yeah, that's the actually um, uh, job of a you know skillful teacher that what they call rocket science if it is explained well, it is actually pretty easy. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's all, People learn in all different ways, and it's fantastic to be able to um, just figure out different ways to explain things. Something might click better for one person or the other, and um, yeah, that's why we got all different shows. The live presentations helps. Kids can ask any questions that they may have, and um, hopefully they... I always ask them at the very end, I'm like, do you have fun? Did you learn something new? And they, that's how they get the roller coaster. I make it a surprise for them. So they have to have fun and they have to learn something new. <laughs> they always get the roller coaster, though, because <laughs> they, always, they always have fun and, and they always seem uh, really excited. I, I know there's been groups sometimes where, you know, they, they seem like they're just, oh, I'm on another field trip and they're not maybe super excited to be there. But the second they leave, they're they're so happy. They seem so excited. They've definitely learned something. They've had such a great experience. Um, but sorry, I, I cut you off. Did, no, did, there's always demand for second roller coaster oh, show yes, after the, the planetarium shows. Oh my gosh, absolutely. They're always like, another one. But man, it is, it's wonderful. And I'm, I'm so glad that, um, to be part of our facility and I'm so glad that we have it to share here on campus. It's, 
um, a fantastic facility. We do have uh, public shows every Saturday, all throughout the day, all different kinds of shows, age groups, um, as well as special events um, often. Uh, other than we mentioned our celebration. Uh, we hope that you can celebrate the eclipse with us. Um, and we have observing events coming up, concerts, mindful moments, all sorts of stuff. So we really, really hope to see you at our, uh, at our planetarium. But I think that is all the time we have for today. So I want to thank you all for joining us in this episode of Discovering the Maverick Factor. We hope this discussion um, was, I hope we had fun. I hope you maybe learned something new. Uh, and uh, I had a wonderful time here with Levent and having this wonderful conversation uh, about uh, the upcoming eclipse, our planetarium. And thank you so much for uh, listening and letting us share this information with you. Sure. Yeah. And we are so fortunate to have you as the program coordinator at the planetarium. And I'm fortunate to have you as which, our uh, director. Organizing these great events, uh, <laughs> special events, uh, any kind of events, quite impressive. It is so fun. I, I can't complain. I, I walk into my office being the planetarium and I go, man, this is my work. It is, it is so incredible. Um, and we love to we love to share the facility and show it off. Yeah, so please come by. So many years in the office, uh, I'm still having the, the that <laughs> first day excitement when I come to the, the planetarium and planetarium office. I always, you know, it's every day is fun. It's the it's the wow factor of it mm -hmm. all. Yeah, I think yeah. that is. I should have mentioned that earlier. One of one of my favorite things when students first walk in the dome is that they all without mm -hmm. um, every group does this um, every time they just. go, because it looks yeah. like you're floating amongst the stars. Yeah, absolutely. It truly really does. But yes, this has been an absolute fantastic discussion. Thank you yeah. so much again, Levin, for joining me. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, until next time. Mm -hmm.